So it's July 18th, 2013, and we're here with Peter, Andrea, and Dean Johnson. And Dean is going to tell us about uh, working as a longshoreman and also, I think, growing up in uh, New Westminster. So I think we'll start a little bit earlier. We've been asking most uh, of you guys to start with how did you become a longshoreman, but why don't you tell us uh, where you grew up in New West and what your, uh, what your experience growing up here was like. Well, New West was a picture postcard city when I grew up. There was only, that I remember, maybe three or four apartment buildings, and they were only four stories high in the whole city or something. Mm -hmm. All the houses were uh, single-family houses. They were, you know, and the, all the yards, and they were well kept up. The houses oh, yeah. were people looked after them. They painted them. Uh, they used to have an old college down here, mm -hmm. St. Peter's College, okay. and it was five stories high at the west end of that lot down there on Agnes, just off Agnes, just below us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a boys, all boys school. Mm -hmm. And it was a Roman Catholic school, and he had a playground there. And so after the schools, all us kids in the neighborhood went up in the playground, and they had a huge big tree, and they had slides built out of mm -hmm. these trees and rings and stuff. Uh, and we would spend all day on that playground till late at night in the summertime. Mm -hmm. I remember 10 o'clock, my mother yelling, Dean, I can hear it calling me, you know. <laughs> Come on, and we would still want to play, you know, in the twilight. And, uh, you know, in the wintertime, with the snow, it was beautiful. Uh, our family, we would go for long walks in the snow along Columbia and all around Agnes and up Carnarvon Street. And it was on all the lights shining on every house, you know. It was really, really beautiful. It almost like uh, you see postcards that, uh, you know, a, a cards where the mm -hmm. city should be. That's where New Westminster was. It was a fantastic place to grow up in. Uh, no crime that I ever even come you know, really. Well, one time down our back lane, the cops were chasing a car. Mm. And that was, uh, and they caught it, you know. But that was the only crime we did. You know, we would, uh, what would we do? We would go on our bikes and we would go all over New Westminster. And our parents never thought of it, no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, we just told Daniel, let's go and we'd <laughs> go all over. Um, I remember when I was young, <laughs> they used to have a foundation from a building right beside our house. They had to go to build an apartment building there or something, and they only did the foundation, mm. and that was as far as they got. And us kids used to play on there. And I fell down there, and I cut my head. I got three oh, no. stitches, I remember, and I was bleeding. And my mother, I was a woman across the street, uh, Mrs. Smith was looking after me when I was playing with her kids. My mother was downtown. Well, I'm going to go downtown to find my mother. And no. I go crying away, <laughs> going down Carnarvon Street, going to go downtown, blood flowing all over the place because you know, it was a head cut. <laughs> and finally, I guess the kids went to the back to the Mrs. To Mums and told me, and she came out and got me and cleaned me up. And when my mother came home, they took me to the doctor, I think it was Dr. Hoff was a doctor, and he was a good doctor, and uh, he stitched me up there, mm -hmm. and that was that. And uh, we used to play cars in that uh, vacant lot, Cliff, we used to uh, have lots of fun. Uh, the kids living up this side of Agnes Street, these, where these, you look around and you see this whole um, apartments, that was nothing but a vacant lot. We mm. used to call it the cliff. We used to play in there with BB guns and everything else, you know. And the kids up there, and, the, and then there was a playground, and then there was us kids down below on Carnarvon Street. And sometimes we would have rock fights. We'd get in our gangs and we'd have go up in the playground and have rock fights and everything else. Oh my goodness. Stuff like that. And it was fun. You know, you get hip, you little rocks, you know, little body, you know. And uh, it was just my territory. Then we'd come up here and we'd be playing with them. And there was the Pierces lived over here and there was other ones, and, you know. And uh, we had a great 
the only great fun. And uh, Carnarvon Street was a fantastic street to live in. They had lovely houses, you know, big houses and yards. Our house was big. I don't know how many rooms we had. Probably had 15 rooms in the house. Wow. You know, and uh, well, it was a manse, and you had on, on the bottom floor, we had, and these were big rooms, you know, bigger than the big rooms you have down here. Mm -hmm. We had one, two, three, four, four big rooms, plus a kitchen, a big kitchen. Mm -hmm. We had a pantry. Pantry is as big as this room. Wow. A pantry was. And then we had going upstairs, the back stairs. And then we had even had what they call a maid's room there, mm -hmm. a small room. And then we had, it was one, two, three, four, well, four other big rooms and then some other rooms. And what my parents did, at the, well, they rented out the room suites. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And one the interesting thing here, and I think about it, was the flood. Was it a 48 flood? Mm -hmm. We had here at 49, right there. We had all the house rented to young girls. Because mm -hmm. there was lots of work at that time, 48, all young women. And the soldiers came to help out in the flood. And you know where they bivouacked the soldiers with their tents? In our front and backyard. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can remember my mother with a milk bottle. Bah, the girls trying to sneak the guys up the stairs. <laughs> guys putting. Uh, ladders and getting ladders and putting against the house and I'm four years old and five watching on a little set night and this. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but it was all, you know, <laughs> it was all fun to me. Wow, it's all excitement. Seeing these soldiers trying to sneak into a house. <laughs> <laughs> so if you lived in the mats, was your dad the minister of that no, church no, no, there? No, no, no. They just sold it separately. And that whole big house, you know what it cost? My, I, I didn't find out till later. We lived on uh, Eigen Street, rented a room there. And uh, my dad was, wasn't was thinking of getting a house or stuff, you know, but my mother was. Mm -hmm. And she somehow found out that mask was for sale for $3,000, that house. Oh, wow. And I don't know how she did it, but she got it, she bought it. <laughs> and was it was on my dad's birthday in February. She says, I got a present for you, Dad. Wow. We bought, this is our house, we bought it. <laughs> wow, so your mom actually bought yeah, it. Yeah, my mom actually bought that house. And so, Dad said okay, and you know, moved in, we had this big house, big yard. Wow. I mean, the, the lot was 80 by 160. That's a, I think that was a big lot. Hmm. And um, would would that be called a boarding house that she, did, did she run it as a boarding house? Uh, uh, no, just, we didn't, uh, Having board, we just rented the rooms out. Okay, so rooming house, rooming house. So boarding house would have meant that you were feeding them. Yeah, you were feeding them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, uh, what did the young women do that were staying when you? Oh, were I was up? for. I don't know what they did. You know. But they were workers. They were all were... working. Yeah, the newest must at that time, as I recollect, that they were uh, a lot of young girls, weren't young women, <coughs> that were working here and there, and they were on their own, and they. You know, it was cheap rent, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we had, and I mean, later on we had an, a woman, named, a French woman named Mamere. We called her Mamere. That was grandma. She was mm -hmm. old. And it was really my dad. She rented, she stayed with us 25, 30 years. Wow. And you know, my dad didn't raise the rent in all that time. Oh, wow. You no, know, didn't ever raise the rent on her. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So did you yeah. become quite close with her? When yeah, she was... yeah, her daughters were there and they babysat us, my kids, we, me and my two sisters, they babysat us and they were they were just like part of the family, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that. Uh, and uh, we never did lock our doors. I don't remember, you know, locking the doors or anything. It was just, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, the one time I remember the door was locked. I I had hitchhiked to uh, Kono, Ontario. And I'd worked there for the summer. And I hitchhiked back. And I came back here and I got up to open the front door and it was locked. What? What? And I'm banging on the door. And this older woman comes out. And she says, oh, so yeah? I says, well, 
who are you? She says, well, who are you? I said, I live here. <laughs> I'm Dean, I live here. Oh, and she was, she'd rented a room there. Oh, yeah. And her name was Mabel, and she was there for 20 years, you know, or something like that, and became very good friends of ours, and we became <laughs> family, became the grandmother, you know. Yeah. Mabel Hooper was her name, and, uh, yeah, that was, we had, Lewis Mission was great, and going to school, going to the old John Robson, mm-hmm. went there, and from grade one to grade grade five, and uh, had lots of fun. We would have, and they played football. There was no swings or nothing like that, just a bit of a We played football, snow, rain, whatever. We played soccer, you know, football. Mm-hmm. We played that. All at every recess and all the time. And then what would we do in the summer, in the springtime? We would draw out on the sand, uh, about as big as this table, a, a line, a rectangle. Then we'd put, we'd get uh, mar- marbles, big, nice looking marbles, mm-hmm. maybe four or five. And you'd sit there, and then the other guys would come along, and if they could and hit that marble with their marble, they got that marble. Mm-hmm. But if they didn't, you got their marble. Ah. So we'd all, hey, you get out there at recess at lunchtime, maybe it was a real, you had to be up there fast to get the space, you see, and draw <laughs> your line, and, and have all the other school kids come along and try and get you a nice big marbles. We as a bag of marbles. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. So, it's, I mean, you know, it was great gambling. It was like, you know, <laughs> trying to do it. Yeah. We did that. Uh, School, Miss Meehan was my, Mrs. Meehan was my grade one teacher, and uh, I remember with her, I'm there, and uh, I was talking, and she's saying, nobody talk, don't talk, be quiet, and I, of course, I kept on talking, I didn't mean nothing to me, well, man, I'm in the back room. <laughs> And I don't know how long I was in the back room, whether the rest of the day or for day. It seemed to me like I was in that back room for the first two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I was cool. Oh, my. But I can tell you. But anyways, no, she was a good teacher afterwards. And what happened then, which my mother always said, is they changed it from that year when I was there from phonetics, teaching how to read mm-hmm. and your letters, from phonetics to another system Mm -hmm. for you don't sound out your words and they taught me that and that bothered me the rest of my life in my spelling because I never learned how to sound out my words oh yeah it was recognition or you should be memorized the Mm -hmm. word and recognize it not sound out the word and you preferred to learn by the sounding out well I didn't know how but my, my parents said what and I noticed that all my life my spelling was no good because I I didn't get the basics of sounding uh-huh. out your words mm-hmm. and what the letters sounded like. It was you're supposed to memorize, you know, right. what the word looks like. But I don't know how long that lasted. Maybe, you know. mm-hmm. and uh, at school it was great. We had uh, I liked the Christmas concerts that the schools put on. They really did a good job in those days. Mm-hmm. Christmas concerts. I actually wanted to ask you, you had mentioned when you um, had fallen down and cracked your head open, you had you went downtown. Where yeah. where was downtown? Columbia downtown. Street. Columbia Street was downtown. Yes. Oh, yeah. Going down, I was going to head down 4th Street, down mm-hmm. to Columbia, and that's when Mrs. Smith caught me and said, no, come on back yeah. here, we can't have you going <laughs> looking for you now, <laughs> with, with a crowd of people. So what uh, was the downtown like that time? A downtown, like you go Columbia Street was busy. I mean, uh, shoulder to shoulder, it was it was packed all the time, as I remember as a kid. And you had those awnings. Every store had an awning that came out, and uh, it was so interesting to watch the windows of the stores and see what they had in them. They looked really good. And Eaton's really at Christmas time was fantastic. You could you could make a special trip to look and see their windows. You know mm-hmm. how they did it arrange things and uh, it was uh, it was really really good uh, the restaurant I never we went the first time I ever ate in a restaurant was at the Hollywood Bowl on mm-hmm. Carnarvon Street they had a restaurant on the side and uh, we had cream peas 
on toast. Wow, I mean, that was something. <laughs> <laughs> that meal. A luxury. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we just didn't, you know, we didn't go out to restaurants. Mm-hmm. Sure. So did your parents do their shopping and all of that kind of thing on Columbia? My dad did the shopping. My my mother did all the shopping, but for groceries and stuff, my dad did that. Oh, yeah. He did the grocery shopping. And I remember when he would come back with marmalade instead of strawberry jam. I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't like marmalade. But then my mother loved it, so that's why. <laughs> yeah. Did he just like to do the grocery shopping, or why did they have it set up that way? Okay, when it comes to money, he handled the money. Mm-hmm. My, and he gave my mother whatever she wanted, mm-hmm. whatever she needed to be. He handled the money. And he was from the old school. He didn't tell your wife anything about finances, mm-hmm. whether you were in debt or whether you were not. My dad never, ever borrowed money. Mm-hmm. And he was never ever broke, even during the depression. He was not, you know, get low, but he was not, never ever broke. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was financial secretary of the Carton's Union, local 1251 up here on Royal Avenue for about 25 years or more. Okay. And uh, he, he handled all the money. And uh, I remember why he was that, because he was a carpenter. And mm-hmm. he would come home and he worked hard. Uh, he was at Ioko. They were tearing down one of those uh, storage containers for oil, mm-hmm. and it collapsed on him. He broke his leg, and I was oh, about no. nine or ten when I came home, and he had his long johns in the sink full of blood. And he was in the hospital for six months. Oh, wow. And then that's when my mother got a job because to support us and mm-hmm. stuff, and he was in the hospital and compensated. I think. Workman's compensation there was seventeen dollars a month, mm. and that's what it was. And so, he, and then they lived on what the renters had, you know, gave us. But my mother got a job in. Uh, she got a job in uh, Royal Columbia. Okay. There, and she worked there for under, under Mrs. Law for a number of years, and then went out to Essendale and worked mm. there. And then when she got her own money, well, she did her own shop. He and all the was you know. Did she like to work? Yeah, she worked a lot of years, and she liked it and mm-hmm. stuff, you know. That's good. And what did she do at Royal Columbian? She was in the uh, laundry department at Rest the At Royal Columbian, she was a cleaning, a cleaning lady, mm-hmm. or, uh, whatever they would call it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But you do the cleaning and make sure the wards are clean and stuff right. like that. And she liked it. She liked the job, and she got her own car, fifty-two Pontiac. Yeah. Wow. So that was something. My dad, <laughs> my dad had a forty-eight Ford. She got a fifty-two Pontiac. Wow. And, uh, and New Westminster was a great city. And then what was it? the the new John Robson School? Mm-hmm. We were changing from uh, Friday. We were leaving the old John Robson on the corner of Queens and Sixth to the new John Robson on Royal Avenue and H Street mm-hmm. on Monday. And I went, I got up and I made sure I was the first student in the old, in the new John Robson school. <laughs> and that used to be, from what I understood then, the old jail and the old courthouse oh, and yeah. something like that. And so we always heard the guys got they hung guys down in the cellar, you know. Oh. And this special thing, you know, and there's solitaire. <laughs> this is what we heard anyways. And uh, then I was a, a patrol boy and oh that was you were somebody you know, school. <laughs> you had the cap, they had the little ah. thing here and they had the patrol sign and you kids you were fifteen minutes. If school started at nine you could be nine fifteen before you got, you know, because ah. you had to go in. And after and school quit, but well, you got out fifteen minutes early. To get oh, that's very set. exciting! <laughs> oh yeah, and you were somebody, you know. <laughs> so Juana was asking you when you got a little bit older and you were a teenager and that kind of thing. What did you do for fun? Where did, did you go out at night and? Oh, a teenager. Yeah, we would. Well, I tell you, I'll start at. My teenage life and the, the type of guys, and I guess even with Long Sean, how I did this, started really when I was in grade five. Mm. You had the toughest kids in school. You were grade six years old. Kenny, Kenny Red and Don Wales, they had a fight. 
Mm-hmm. And of course, all our boys were around. You know, this was after school in Tipperary Park mm-hmm. and watching this fight. And Donnie Wales won. Kenny Vid got a bleeding nose. And Donnie Wales says, Anybody else want to fight me? And stupid me, I says, Yeah. <laughs> and I got him and I beat him. Wow. Well, then I was in grade five, and then I have to fight while you, you know, guys were fighting. And, I, and so I used to get O's in, all the time in school, in elementary. That was outstanding. Mm-hmm. And school was good to me. Then we went to Vincent Massey. Well, there's 1,500 kids. Who was a tough guy in your school? Well, Dean was a tough guy. <laughs> oh, well, in Moody Park at noon hour, for the first while, I was fighting there every noon hour, and I was too scared to lose. So, <laughs> <laughs> so from the other feeder schools and stuff, would you yeah. fight like their tough yeah, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was doing. And so, anyways, uh, that's when I got into the, the orangutan crowd. You know, when grade seven was okay, grade eight was we just barely made it through grade nine, mm-hmm. and then. I mean, barely made it through grade eight. In grade nine, I never did make it through grade nine. Mm-hmm. Halfway through was get out. Second year came back, and my friend Roger Stonehouse and Harry Bailey and me. I think Roger was out on Wednesday, Harry Bailey on Thursday, and I got kicked out on Friday. You know, it was, we can get rid of you guys and oh don't goodness. ever come back no. and stuff like that. So then that start. We started. Hitchhiking around the country, you know, doing things. But Roger's dad was a longshoreman. Harry Bailey's dad was a foreman on the beach. Mm. So that's how I got into longshoring. Okay. So what yeah. age were you when you started longshoring then? Well, I had worked one day in Prince Rupert when I was 16. Mm-hmm. At Port Edward on Pulp. But I came down here and I started when I was 17. Down okay. here. December the 13th, 1961. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. So what was your first day like when you went down to the hall? Well, we went down to the hall before that and waiting for work. And there was no work, so we'd be playing rummy and stuff, or go out and bang and hang around and do something. And always go home and tell your mom and dad, ah, there was no work today, couldn't do, you know. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. go down the next day. Then you got your own group of guys down there. That, yeah. So it was an enjoyable because you went down to see what was going on and stuff like that. And you, you could socialize. Socialize. That was your social thing in the hall. And then you got a, I got a day. And uh, I'd worked at the Royal Columbia newspaper in the circulation department, packing papers up for the, the big presses, you know, mm-hmm. down in the basement. And uh, I got maybe cleared. And I worked sometimes 14 hours a day there, and I, I probably cleared $50 wow. a week. And everything. I cleared that. So, I worked the first week was on sacks, if I remember right, and it was so hard that I would go home, I'd go up, I'd walk up here to the Canary Street, and go to sleep, wouldn't have supper, wake up the next day, have a big breakfast, and my mom would give me a lunch, and I'd go down and I'd work, and after a couple of days I was going to quit, but I thought, oh, I'm tough, I'll tough this thing out for the week, and then, you know. So I toughed it out for the week. There's heavy, 120 pound sacks, and I was probably wow. 140, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, anyways, uh, after the week, they had us work Saturday, half a day Saturday. Well, because I was, well, I didn't like that. <laughs> but we worked half. I came back, and I wasn't going along shore anymore. That was the end of that, you know. I was so I, but I went back to pick up my check. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it was one hundred and twenty dollars. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, those sacks were that heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so what they did, they seduced me with money and kept me with benefits. <laughs> so you came back the next. I came week. back, and forty-eight years later, I retired. <laughs> oh my goodness! What was uh, what was it about the sacks that were hard, made them hard work? Well, the weight, mm-hmm. and what happens? You have to grab the sacks, and it was flour, mm-hmm. and they would rub the edges of Ooh. your arms and you get all red and you know and the skin would come off Ooh. and you, you have to pick them up and you have to carry them and what we had to do in those days for that first job was we built you almost like we called it a railroad you get those um, pallet boards they were big heavy pallet boards and we'd line up and make a road to the wing mm-hmm. and we had a big heavy dolly and uh, the thing must have weighed a couple hundred pounds you know, you, could, you had to have two, maybe three guys to pick the thing up. And we'd take the dolly out, 
and they'd land a load on it. Maybe there'd be 35 to 40 sacks on a load in a pellet. And uh, we'd wheel it into the wing and then we'd get to uh, load it and stack it up mm -hmm. as high as you could do it in the wing. And uh, then wheel it back out, you know, and get another load. We'd do that all day. Mm -hmm. And you had to walk over the sacks because we floored off the sacks and the floor wasn't solid. It was on sacks. So, Ooh. you know, it was uh, you carrying 120 pounds a year on sacks and it's you're floppy and yeah. it's real, you know. And the floor wasn't, you know, you had to be very careful. You'd break your ankle on it, you know. Yeah. Because that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. So that's why I thought, well, I don't want this. But then when the money came, I thought, well, hey, I can tough it out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So how did you learn what to do when you got sent out on your first day and you got the, your day of work? There, there's a side runner. Our gang was like 13 guys. You had a hatch tender, two winch drivers, two slingmen, and eight guys down below. Mm -hmm. and on each side was four guys on each side. And one of the four was a side runner. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible to tell you what to do and to show okay. you any new guys what to do and stuff like this and how to stow and you listen to him because he had the he had the power to kick you off but what he would do was just tell the Haston hey this guy is you know get rid of him he's not working you know yeah and uh Haston would just say hey kid phone at home get a replacement for this kid and, oh, wow. or this guy whoever it is and you're gone they would uh, ditch you in the middle of a shift they would ditch you right in the middle of the shift or, you know, sometimes, or you'd go for lunch, come back, and you'd be replaced. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd keep you till noon hour. Right. And then, if you, you know, you know that they would replace, the guy, replace you. Mm -hmm. And, that, and uh, so, but that was good because that, we you know, the guys who just didn't, couldn't do anything, you know, some guys, you know, tried and they just, you know, couldn't do it. I, I like, I believe it. Half the guys that are longshoring today would not be longshoring if they had to go through that. They just couldn't do the work, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they just wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Well, there was a couple of guys there that I that I know. One guy, he's still long. He's retired now. But he, uh, his dad would bring him to work, get him a job at the hall from the dispatcher, take him to the to the ship where the job is, take him up there, <coughs> give his dispatch slip to the foreman, and say, okay, go to work. And he would go down the foreman, say, okay, go down the hatch, he would stand there. And he'd work, he would just stand there, you know. Foreman says, get to work, he says, no, I'm not working. Oh, my. You don't like it, get out, get fired. Okay, thanks very much, and climb up the ladder and go. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, he did that, you know, Hoppy was his name. We did that. We called him Hoppy. You know, but we did that. He did that so long. But he, I guess uh, he was like that. He hardly worked at all. But then I guess he found a job, his niche that he could do. And uh, he, oh, stayed there. he stayed there for the, until he retired. But he found some job mm -hmm. that he could do. Did he not want to do the jobs that uh, no, no, his dad was having no, him set up for? No. And I know another guy, Woods, he would do the same thing. His dad would do the same thing and get him down there. And But he did. He, he quit long show. You know, his dad finally gave up. He's not going to be. And he, Woods got his own garage, and he had, had a very good life. Mm -hmm. But just, you know, long showing just wasn't, no matter what, wasn't his. But maybe if his dad didn't try. You know, and were the guy. dads, in both cases, longshoremen? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess that was sort of a, I'm not doing what you're doing. Like me, yeah. my dad was a carpenter. Well, I never wanted to be a carpenter. He could, <laughs> you know, he could, I could have jobs as carpenters, helpers, and out of the union hall. Normally, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go on my own. Mm -hmm. So probably they felt the same way mm -hmm. in those days, you know. Was it, uh, do you think it made a difference for you that your dad wasn't a longshoreman? Oh, yeah. Good, yeah. good bad? Well, wow. it was bad. I got, see, in those days, if your dad was like my friend Roger, his, he was on a special board that would get out ahead of me because mm. he was a member's son. They had a member's son's board. Oh, wow. You know, I get out. And what they did, uh, explained to us, was that if the 
the father got hurt, then the son could keep money coming into the family. Oh. This is why that was explained to us why the other members. That was their gave explanation. It, explanation yeah. for getting it. But you know, us guys, we never thought, you know. But uh, it didn't bother me. I accepted it. With, mm-hmm. You know, hey, I'm not. Uh, so did it take you longer then to get enough hours uh, to work year. your way up the board then, do you uh, think? Roger got in a year ahead of me. Oh, okay. And did you start uh, around the, members, the same time? Yeah. And But no, because he, he, he was a member, son. he started, he, we started together, but he got out ahead of me, maybe four months or six months ahead of me. Oh, he okay. got a job and got out. Oh, so he was able to start And I still had to hang out, soon. yeah, he, mm-hmm. would, he would go straight, <coughs> straight on the board. Mm-hmm. And you had to sit in the I hall and wait the around. Hall. And yeah, and wait around. He went straight yeah. on the board. He would, well, he would, you know, instead of, I would get one day a week, and he would get, he'd be getting two, mm-hmm. maybe three days a week, and I'd be getting one. Mm-hmm. But that's the way it is. But if I had, a, my, my dad had been a member, well, okay, I'd have been on the board with him. But then the member's sons by, got it, sort of hated by the other guys. Ah, you're a member's son. You know, <laughs> you, know you got all these privileges, we you know, you know. Yeah. So they got a little bit that way. Mm-hmm. And um, what, what else? Uh, Tell us about when you became a member. When I became a member, well, we had to go and I had to get two guys to sign me in, two members to sign me in. And uh, as they, and then they signed, signed the papers and stuff and had to get a medical and stuff like that and it was all okay. And then we get in, go to the meeting and you got sworn in and then you went out with your friends <laughs> and it had a party and it was all on you, you or the guys that got sworn in. And it, it was a big deal, but it wasn't that big a deal like it is today. Mm-hmm. Like today it's a really big deal where they'll rent the, the bar and they'll, you know, it costs them thousands, and, you know, today. Mm-hmm. There it cost me about 300. It was more informal. Yeah, and I went to the dining and I just paid for the rounds, you know, and stuff like that. We all did that. Mm-hmm. Or whatever. And so, but it was it was a big thing. Mm-hmm. Once you, if you, when you were not, I remember you were a kid. Mm-hmm. I hate you doing that. You're not, you're, you're, you're not, you not well, you were a okay, but you weren't, Treated very well, but once you remember, it was no hey, the bosses, the former, they, they all treated you with respect, hmm. you know. And uh, from then on, you were treated with respect. And did you notice that right away when you became a member? You noticed it right away. Mm-hmm. There was a a big difference in the way people looked and treated you, mm-hmm. and and the, the company treated you and everything else. You were oh, a member, yeah. and you. You walk around the dock. You were pretty proud. You remember, <laughs> and hey, and people listen to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you. And once you remember, and you're on the docks, your opinion counted. <laughs> With safety, with whatever else, you know, and you felt that. Hey, I now I've been here six years. It took me six years to be a member, but I've been here six years. Okay, my opinion uh, counted, and uh, mm-hmm. the foreman. Well, I remember it was. They treated you with respect. A lot of times, it was Mr. Johnson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The guys that knew you, forming you knew good, call you know, called you Dean Hating, you know. But uh, one foreman that didn't know you, it was Mr. Johnson. Could oh. you please do this? We'd like you to do this or that. So, I mean, that was a big difference. It wasn't say, hey, kid, get over here. You know, oh, yeah. Or, hey, you, or anything like that. Wow. And what was the swearing in ceremony like? What did well, they have? <laughs> they still have the same oath. It was, you all got up and you, st- you stood in front of the membership and you had the president or an ex-president or whatever stand in front and read you the oath and you had to copy the oath and it was a long oath you took (laughs) you know and you finally got through that and they okay then everybody shook your hands and stuff like that everybody clapped and stuff Mm -hmm. and then you went down and you sat down for the rest of the meeting and then after the meeting you know would that have been the first meeting that you went to? That was the first un- union meeting. first union meeting? Yeah, only members could go to union oh, meetings. Oh, okay. So that was the first union meeting you were at. Okay, and then you got to sit down and watch the proceedings and yeah, how it all goes. Yeah, how it all goes and stuff like that. And they had some pretty good union. A lot, a lot of times it would be 10 o'clock at night and they'd stop the clock because, hey, business wasn't over. And it was, you know, those guys were really 
dedicated to unionism, and they argued different points of view and stuff like that. And it was uh, a real democracy, like, I mean, you know. And uh, it was really good. The un union then was really, mm -hmm. r really tough, really tight. But they, when it comes to the union meetings, they'd all whatever they had, they had all kinds of points of view, and they would people were pretty uh, passionate about the points of view. Right. And uh, at the meetings, you could talk. You know, uh, one thing about in all my years. I haven't worked with other unions, you know, meaning other unions, but I've heard that a lot of them are run from the top down. Mm -hmm. The Longshore Union, ILW, has always been in line, is run from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have at times disagreed with our presidents and stuff, and had a, everybody said, we belled and said, oh, you're out, you're impeached, and we will elect a new president right now, oh. <laughs> off the floor. Wow. <laughs> so we, we had a, in 69, we had a, we were in negotiations with the company, and we didn't like what they were coming up with mm -hmm. the contracts. And we had big boisterous meetings and stuff like <laughs> that. And uh, we kicked the negotiating the negotiating committee. We kicked them all out, and the president and everything else out, and got new ones in right mm -hmm. then, and started all over again. <laughs> wow! Do you remember what the issue was at the time? Uh, money, <laughs> money, and um, and uh, it was money, and they wanted to bring in a new schedule, work schedule, mm. and there are probably other ones too, but that was the other things that stuck me was money in the work schedule. Was that when they were looking to change it to three shifts? Um, and yeah. to go 24 hours? Or yeah, three like shifts of, you know, two shifts or three shifts. Probably it brought it in two shifts and three shifts. And what are they going to pay us for the second and third shift and mm -hmm. stuff like that? Okay. That's when Trudeau forced us, the first time Trudeau forced us back to work. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we were shut down and Big Deal and Trudeau came along and forced us back. So we've been forced back to work, at least the BCMEA at that time, mm -hmm. for all the years since. We've never ever, I think only once, we, this, the latest one we settled the other time, you know, the federal government has forced us back to work. Mm -hmm. So we go back to work, but we always figured out a way of getting around them, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so how did the membership feel about being forced back? Was that a point of pride or was it something that you guys would prefer not to have happened, or? Well, we would prefer not to have happened and had negotiated ours, you know. But being forced back, it was, um, what did that, well, how I felt, what, how can they do this? We're not slaves, you know. What, they can't make, force me to work. But then with all the fines you had and stuff like that, even though we, I was young, you're feeling that way, you, uh, so, well, okay, and, uh, we'll go back to work, but uh, we were half speed. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll go back to work, but we'll show you where. Oh, uh, okay. So you found a way to. Still oh yeah, work. there's always a way to, you know, <laughs> get your point across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we did pretty good that year, mm -hmm. and uh, really, I worked at West Shore Terminals mm -hmm. in uh, when Goodall brought in the. Wages and price freezing, you know, that time. Mm -hmm. And we figured out a way, you know, you couldn't get actual wage, but you could do this, and you know. We got our biggest gains in that year in our contract for West Shore, the biggest gains ever when, we were, when the wage and price freeze. Mm -hmm. We just, as long as we got it by the Employees Association, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we found out ways. So were you... A were you in West Shore from the beginning? No, I was from, from 75 on. I started in 61, and I went there in 1975. So, um, can you tell us about how you how you came to be at West Shore? Uh, you know, because that from, well, from what you're saying, it sounds like you went there from the start. No, 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 yeah. no. I was well in 74, December 9th, 74. I became a Christian, hmm. and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. So, it was in 75, 
uh, there hasn't been much work. I haven't got much work, and I needed a day's pay because the mortgage is coming up. So I'm sitting at the hall, and we West Shore had been going since 1970, and it was a rotten. All we heard, all the junior guys went there, you know, casuals, and I was a rotten lousy job that is, and everything else. So none of you know, only the guys that were couldn't work anywhere else went there. You know, they got kicked off the beach, and they couldn't work any for any other company. who went there. So it was on a Monday, and I wanted, and there was no work. It was in, uh, in the afternoon shift, and there was no work. So I was sitting there, and I said, well, Lord, yeah, you know I need a job. Could you give me a job? Mm-hmm. And not more than five minutes later, hey, we need a guy to go to West Shore. And I thought, no, I'm not going to that place. <laughs> you know, I will not. Uh, I don't know. Then I said to myself, you just was praying for a job, and a job come up, are you going to slap God in the face and say, you know, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, I go there. Well, I went there. And I tell you, I was a prima donna by that time. <laughs> you know, I I went out, drove out there, and uh, we, they didn't have cover all at the time. So they're going to take me to this machine to operate. Okay, there's an old truck, you know. The truck was dirty, you know, coal dust. I said, I'm not going in there. The foreman has a nice clean truck. He says, you drive me to the machine. So he drives me out there, and you got to get out of his truck and go from here to the wall on this coal. It was sort of a rainy day, you know, mud. there was mud, and I haven't got money. I says, get a piece of plywood down there, and I'll walk in the plywood, and I'll walk to that machine. And uh, that's what you want. And I says, okay, I want no plywood. Get, get a little closer. He got a little closer, and I just jumped out and I jumped on the machine. Now, I don't know how to operate this machine. I don't know. He says, well, there's a couple of buttons there that are using. You just go up there and do it. So I go up there, and I say, it's a stacker machine, double stacker. Okay, and you're on the radio. Okay, watch. You see a button there that's red? Yeah, and then one of that's green. Press the green button, and I'll do it stack. If any problem, press the red button. And to make it go up and down the rails, You've got this other button that goes east and west, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, start it, and I run it, you know, all night. And uh, come back, and he had to come back and pick me up and get close, and I would get into the car for lunch, and that's how it was. <laughs> I got quite known for that, you know. <laughs> Wanting plywood, you know. Yeah. I wouldn't get my shoes dirty on that, you know. But it was, hey, it was a good job. I was called back the next day and stuff mm-hmm. and this time I was prepared for right. it, you know. And because I was just dressed like and, and so I went there and I worked was good. Thought, well this ain't such a bad job. You know, really. And steady and so time came up for a couple months later, a permanent position out there. Well, I'll take that. People just don't. That's not a job for you. Why are you crazy? I said, I'll take that. I'll try it. So I took the permanent position. Well, and that was it. I was in a gang. And I went to went to different gangs because there, uh, there was a little mix up with the with, with the posting. So mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> so I was in different gangs. They kept me, but a guy with more seniority had posted for it. Mm-hmm. Just at the same time I did, which I didn't know, the, the, the union got mixed up. So they sent me out there as if I got the posting, but then when this guy complained and they showed that he, he had more seniority, he looked mm-hmm. at me and he, he had posted at the same time, he got it. But West Shore, they kept me. Mm. And they kept me, well, you're just, as guys, you need uh, uh, we be replaced, you just go into this game for this holiday and for that, you know, guys take holidays. So I did. And so that was, I was there from. I think it was in, from February, first of February, I think. And when it came to summer, the July, I said, I'm taking holidays. And West Shore said, uh, well, you can. I mean, you know. I said, give me my holidays. I'm going. Mm-hmm. I says, well, I'm going anyways. I'll see you. You know, I'm, and uh, they said, oh, well, we'll just wait a little bit. And they gave me, I mean, if I had been steady, I would have got five weeks holiday, mm-hmm. but I wasn't steady. But they gave me five weeks holiday anyways. Oh wow! So I mean, they were good, good company to work for. I get five weeks paid holiday, and away I went. And I had a good time, and then came back. By that time, when I came back, 
there was a need another permanent guy, and I was the next guy, and I got a permanent job, mm. and I just got it. They just agreed to hire, to hire me permanent within minutes, just in time, because mm -hmm. I was they were teaching me how to operate the MX. It's a huge, big machine mm -hmm. with a bucket wheel on it and crawlers, and you have a cat that levels off. And I'm doing teaching me. I'm doing this. And as a cat went underneath me, I came back and I knocked the red light off the cat. And I on the big, well, the head <laughs> of Wesho, fire him. And Joe Briggs says, you can't, you just hired him five minutes ago. You can't fire him. Now he's done. <laughs> so from then on, I go. stayed. Yeah, just in the nick of time. Yeah, Joe saying, my baby, just in the nick of time. He just hired me. They were just in there getting me hired. He just agreed to hire me permanently. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't fire me yet. Well, but it was nothing. We just knocked off the light anyways, you know, and yeah. stuff. But Westshore was a very good company to work for. And it was more steady work, right? Did yeah, it was you work all steady. from the same times every yep. day? Yeah, same times and three shifts a day, days, afternoons, and graveyards. And uh, it was more steady. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, did you find that um, to be benefit, or did you like that? Was it beneficial? I, I, to have I learned, that yeah, yeah, I like the, I like the mm -hmm. benefits of it. I like the holidays of it. I, uh, you could arrange things better. You mm -hmm. know? My family, okay, this is you know time off. This is it, and any overtime was double time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, wow. that was that. So it's good for your family too. That yeah, it was good. Good same. for the family. Good for everything. You know, I. And that that summer when I went to five weeks, I, I uh, it was really good. I mean, I, we went up to uh, Barkerville in oh, July, yeah. and it started to snow, so we started yeah. to head south. So we headed south between lakes, just south of uh, was it Kelowna, and uh, stayed there. My wife was sick for the cold for three days, so I taught my son how to swim there. And I looked in a newspaper, and there was a cabin on the Okanagan Lake for sale. Hmm. For forty five hundred dollars. Well, that's a misprint, you know. So two days later, I get the paper again. See, man. Well, let's go up. I phone him up. Now, just forty five hundred dollars. Yep. You want to come up and get it? So they told me where to go on the west side road of the, by Vernon. Mm -hmm. You know, on the north end. I went up there and got it. And there's a dilapidated shack. And I go to and I to home. It's supposed to be green and white. That's not green. I go and here's a lovely little cabin, green and white, two bedroom cabin. Went in there, furnished and everything. It's got your propane fridge, stove, everything in there, everything you want, and your own private dock, wow. and your beach, everything. And the people and I says, well, well, this looks like the cabin what they described to me. So I went there and they says, yeah, this is the cabin. You're the guy. You you Dean Johnson, yeah. Forty-five hundred. We've had this in our family for years, and you're a young family. Forty-five hundred dollars. We're going to get a, a camper, mm -hmm. and we got a price. And you're the only people that answered the ad. Hmm. I guess everybody thought it was a mis misprint, like I did at first, and never answered it. So I says, okay. And I says, I'll have the. They wanted cash. I said, I'll have the cash here Thursday, and that was on a Tuesday. I went down, drove right down here, and my father-in-law. I told him. I was going to the bank, he says, no, I'll give you the money, and you pay me back, and it won't be less. So I got the cash from him, went back up there, paid it, and I had it there for, mm. you know, for years. Did 4500 seem like it was too low? Oh, yeah. Even then, mm. it seemed like it was <laughs> pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I thought, you know, it's right. a misprint, you know. Yeah. Right. So when did you, when had you gotten married, and what? I got married at 69. Oh, Yeah. Well, no, 68, 68, December of 68. And were you already a member then yeah. when you were married? Yeah, I was a member, yeah. Mm -hmm. did, you, um, did you wait to become a member before you got married? No, I was a member already. And uh, no, I never, that never entered my mind. Yeah. I woke up one more Tuesday morning in, in Reno and I was married. <laughs> Had you been on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> I went down. Me and my girlfriend went down there for, you know, just go to, you know, you know. Woke up, hey, I'm married, and we were married for 29 years. <laughs> wow. How did you meet uh, your... Sloppy your Joes. Soon-to-be soon wife, Sloppy Joes? Yeah, right down. Her and his sister and her brother. 
Had them down there in sloppy joes, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, hung around there. That, you know, that was, you, you were there, I was there every day, you know, mm -hmm. and at night. And that's what was socialized, all you meet and all, you met all the girls there, you met, you know. Oh, yeah. Whole new, any young people wanted to meet any young people, he went down there. So that wasn't that wasn't a longshore thing. That was uh, no. That was uh, that was a new west thing. New west thing. Anybody from new west, everybody <laughs> met all kinds of people there. Yeah, yeah. It was a new west thing. He hung around there. As well, a young person, sorry, Peter. As a young person who was a longshoreman, did you have like a lot of spending money? Did you find it, oh, feel yeah. like you had a lot of? Oh yeah, I, I had I had lots of spending money. Yeah. And you could, as a young person, Wednesday night, if you go to the Dunny or something, you know, I started. I was in that only at 17, 18, 19, 20. I remember I had my first, when I was 21st, 21. I was big, and Tony, Tony Lethwick used to be a, lo a hockey player in, uh, in, in, in the NHL. He owned it then. How you doing, come on. And he sit down there and I'm a book. He said, how old are you? 21, what? <laughs> Show me your ID and I showed him my ID. And he kicked me out, he says, for four years, you've been drinking here <laughs> and put me in jeopardy. And I never got back in until he sold the place. Just like, he sold the place about two years later. Right? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, Were yeah. there any places that were particular hangouts of Longshore? Well, there was a terminal was from, for some Longshore when they hung out. I didn't really hang It was too far away, and it was for the... Older longshoremen than me, mm. you know, they hung out there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't for me. I was with a young group, and we went to the Russell and the Windsor. Even the Windsor was really for the old timers a bit. It was a Dunny and mm -hmm. the Russell. Mm -hmm. If you really wanted to be classy, we'd go to the King Ed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I got kicked out of the King when I was twenty-one. That year must be pretty wild. The best wouldn't. Uh, let me in till noon. <laughs> <laughs> at noon, you can come in. Because if I came in at nine, well, by noon, I was dead. <laughs> and, uh, boy, from the Dunny, Royal Towers was the only place I could drink for a few months there. <laughs> I got kicked out of the King Eddie, and I wasn't even there. <laughs> I went in there with a few longshore friends, and then it was on a Thursday. Yeah, you know what? Then okay, let's go down. And, uh, it was my turn to go down and pick up the checks at the hall. So I went down. I got all their numbers and work numbers. Went down, pick up a check, and come back with the checks. And where are they? Yeah, you and those guys. Well, yeah. Where are they? You kicked out too. <laughs> <laughs> Here they started a food fight. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh no! So I met them back down the hall, gave them all the checks, <laughs> and I was I was out of there for it. So you, um, from the beginning, were on were on ships. So you were deep sea. Yeah. And and I mean, we heard a little bit about um, the deep sea versus the dock level. Yeah. And um, do you, do you remember that and and how the how that how those merged and. Uh, well, yeah, the dock local locals got less money. So if you worked the, on the docks, you got less money than deep sea. And what happened was when we merged them. We took all of them in as members. Maybe there was even casuals there mm -hmm. that had just started two months before. Oh, wow. Took them in as members. So uh, that caused a bit of friction, but it was the only way we could do it, you know, to, to merge as one. And there was one, two, maybe four or five guys that were just started. They, good, my good friend, Mal McLeod, he was there two months. All of a sudden, he was a member. Mm. <laughs> and you got a couple of other guys that were there, you know, maybe six months, because you know. And you weren't even a member then. I had just been a member. Just then. made a member. Right? Yeah, I remember that. I had just yeah. made a member there, and uh, uh, they were a member instead of taking the six years, you know, and doing all this stuff. They were, and but it wasn't nothing to do with them. That was it. Like now, McLeod, when he went down there, he was at the unemployment office, and he could event to a mill or down to the docks. So he went down to the docks and he could hire it on there permanently. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a month later, he was a member. Wow. He just went, you know, just to look at the job. And he was a member and he had all the, you know, all the work he wanted, you know. So. Mm -hmm. But no, when I was young, I mean, I started at 17 and I had, 
I mean, uh, I had a 56 Ford at 17, and you know, that's in 61, 62. Mm -hmm. I had, in, I had a uh, 60, I had a nice 59 Pontiac Parisian gold colored convertible. Wow. Four door, you know, two door, you know, cruising around the Westminster like that, you know, just real. And, and then I, on the top of that, I had that big 59 Monarch, which I've never ever seen one again. Wow. Cruising around in that thing, big, huge, 20, you know, 22 <laughs> feet long or something like that. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, I had a, a <laughs> my teenage years were pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you yeah. were able to buy all the toys and that I kind of had, thing. I had your... the toys and I had, I had the, you know. But it, it, in those years, it didn't matter whether I worked one day a week or five days a week. I got paid Thursday and I was broke Monday. <laughs> and there was sometimes, you know, I woke up in jail Monday. Then I knew I had a good time in the weekend, <laughs> you know. You were still living at home then? Yeah, partly. When I, <laughs> I, all... Agnes Street here, all these appointments that we were down Agnes Street at the time, and I never lasted a month in either one of them. I'd go and rent a furnished apartment, you know, and then about 20, get out. Go to the next <laughs> go <to> home. <laughs> next month, get another apartment, furnished apartment. <laughs> the friend of mine, uh, Brian Ross, he's another longshoreman. He was on his own. We were 18, he was... And he said, well, why don't you uh, come on, we'll live together in the corner of 4th and uh, Agnes, that apartment building there. Okay, went in there on Thursday, paid it, had a party there Friday. <laughs> he left with his, he used to belong to the catwalk, his motorcycle club. He left to go down, they went and go down to LA, but he only made it a little wage, you know. He came back Sunday morning and the doors were locked. <laughs> The keys and his stuff was done. We were, we were, we had uh, this big party we had. It was, it was, I never had a party like that in my life before. His, his, um, his, <coughs> his motorcycle club, he had a party with his motorcycle club and everything was going cool. And uh, he says, Dean, why don't you get some of your friends from Sloppy Jones? I said, Brian, you know, my friends. Oh, yeah, come on, I'd have a few drinks, sure. Well, I make a phone call to Sloppy Joe's. Hey, this is Dean Klein. We're having a party at my place. This is the address. Well, man, it just came. I mean, I don't know. We're, one day, it was so full. I'll tell you an idea. It was so full, we had, there was some girls who were having a pajama party someplace, and they heard about it. And they came down in their pajamas, <laughs> and we couldn't even let them in. They oh had my God. dance and stuff in the hallway, because it was so full in the apartment. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there was about 15 girls in the hallway that couldn't get in. And, you know, so, and the cops are going around and around. But you know, we invited other people from the apartment building to, to join, and so nobody complained. Ah. But then the manager, you know, we're going to kick us. That was a, well, your first, your second day in the apartment. What's the rest going to be like? So I, I went home between apartments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So and why it, did you keep getting kicked out? Was it always like parties and that kind that's, of thing? Or? That's 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 why. Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, no, never. It wasn't for lack of payment. I always had the money. But it was uh, yeah. too much noise, too much trouble. Get out. Because you know, <laughs> what is he? What are you going to do when you're 18 and 19 and you got? When did you? Uh, when did you finally? How should we say? Settle or find a find a place and and and. When I got married. And when you got married, and, and where did you where did you live then? Uh, Third Avenue and, and just on Sixth Street is the apartment building there. Okay. And how long were you there? And oh, I was there six months. Then I moved to to all the work was in Surrey and all that time, so I moved out to Surrey uh -huh. in a basement suite. And then from then I moved out to a, <clears throat> a corner of uh, King George Highway. And Fraser Highway. There was an old dance hall there that converted into apartments. Mm -hmm. okay. I stayed there, and then I was there for you know. I was there, and this is all over a period of, uh, I guess, a year and a half. You know, mm -hmm. it, you know, and then I went and I bought a brand new house out of Brookswood. 
brand new house on a quarter acre, 22,300. Mm -hmm. And I remember I thought that was, Oh, boy, I'm going to have to work. I'm really tying myself down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But I uh, moved out there, and that's how I started, mm -hmm. you know, settling down. I, I got married, but it took me five years to realize I was married. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't think my lifestyle changed that much. Mm. You, know. you went out and... I don't know, I'm just, I'm just social. I did it, you know. I, yeah. My... My lifestyle didn't change until I became a Christian. My mm -hmm. lifestyle was uh, get up in the morning, that time, get up at noon, say hello to the wife and my son, bring her around, leave her around one o'clock, pick up Leo Amaro, go to the dunny, sit there and drink till four, go to five, at five o'clock, go to the hall, pick up, a, get a job, work till one, go to the nightclub in New Westminster till whatever, get home, go to sleep, wake up, <laughs> just, you know, uh, that was the, you know, didn't save any money, just, you know, mm -hmm. just lived, if I'd have been smart, you know, I could have, you know, I did a lot better, but <laughs> my, I, I wasn't that, the greatest of kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> When uh, when you say the work was in Surrey, but you were you moved out there, but you were coming back here for the hall, and you were coming yeah. back here for the nightclub. Yeah. So so I mean, it sounds like you're saying you were, you you probably you come to town a couple of times a day. Well, no, I'd come to town mm -hmm. and go to work, and the nightclub was here, and go to the nightclub, and then mm -hmm. I'd go home. Mm. Well, the work was here in New West. Well, no, I well. Sometimes it well, it was all up and down the river. So I, sometimes I go back, but I, you had to come in here to get a job, anyways. Yeah. And sometimes you would go across, had to go back to face mm -hmm. the Suey Dock, or you'd go to the Cry Dock or whatever it would be. And uh, you know, that time that was in the early seventies, you know, mm -hmm. late late sixties, mm -hmm. and that. But the, you know, another, and then. Stabilization was working at West Shore. It took me away right. from all my own friends too, and you know, and a completely different lifestyle. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it was that. But did you want to know about New Westminster? Oh, you've known about New Westminster and the docks and everything else. You know all about that. Well, I think I think. Why, why don't you Why don't you start talking about those things that you you prepared? Because we've I've learned a lot already, um, but there's more. Yeah. There's always more, so yeah. Well, just, you know, the companies that were working there, the West Shore Empire, you know, Canadian, and different other companies, you know. What were some of the, what were some of the good companies to get a job with, and what were some of the not-so-good companies to get a job with? Well, they, they were, for me, they were all the same. We did the same work, you know. They, all, Different, only difference was was a different different color paint on the equipment, but you did mm -hmm. the same work. And for the foreman, there was only two foremen that I really had the trouble working with. One was so grumpy, and never, I never ever did see him smile. Mm -hmm. You know, he was always mean, you know, cranky and everything else. And the other guy I used to work with, and he was one of the lazy guys and so when he became a foreman it was uh, I know exactly what he what he used to do he used to be dry forklift down the hatch mm -hmm. and at quarter to ten coffee break he'd drop a load of lumber a package lumber all over the hatch and we'd have to go pile it up and he'd sit oh. back in his lip truck and take out his pocketbook and start reading or else you know and we'll have his coffee and at quarter quarter to twelve he'd do the same thing he'd oh, no. go for lunch boys and of course, we'd have to repile the load and stuff. So he, he do that, and he, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, he was, you know, he was. That's why he was hard for me to work with. But we're friends now; we still see each other and stuff. But it, in those times, it was. Uh, I really had to force myself. To, okay, you know, not to, mm -hmm. not to get mad at him or anything else. But that was otherwise all the other foremen and stuff. He, Good. Yeah. If you ever had trouble working with anyone, how was that settled? 
or maybe if it was someone who wasn't a foreman, well, but more on your... how was it settled? Uh, yeah. Uh, either by talking and telling the guy right up front. If he didn't go, it was go off site, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a couple of fights, major, you know, what I would see, major fights. I would, when I joined the gang, uh, Big Glenn, he was the strongest man I ever met in my life. I mean, yeah. you know, gloves are gloves that only come to here on. <laughs> you know. The end of his fingers. Yeah, it's yeah. about the end. And I was his partner for a year. Right. We had this guy, Blackie, and he was a big man, six foot, over six foot. And uh, we, we yappy, he used to call him yappy. He talked, talked, yappy. And I don't know what the deal was, but I know Len put his hand on his head and squeezed his head and brought him right down to his knees. And he said, any more of that? And I'll squeeze your head like a grape. Oh. And that was, that was it. <laughs> Now, I don't know, Don't I, I, I never asked Len about it, or Blackie about it, because they were both big men, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and just, you know, that was it. Um, what else? There was, Sometimes were there fist fights ever, or? Well, my friend Roger, who I started with, knew this guy, Lou. Uh, he was really known for sucker punching guys. I never ever mm -hmm. saw him face a guy right on. He always mm -hmm. either come up behind or something mm. and one time we were working and this guy uh, we saw a guy lying on dock a friend of ours Norm and uh, what happened he was just four o'clock in the morning we worked the graveyard shift you know go to the fire and uh, oh Lou got me oh I, he did it and so Roger went up and he's walking down on the ship and he saw uh, the pin of a of a of a knuckle, you know, of a, of a turnbuckle, not a turnbuckle, but a shackle pin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he picked it up, and Lula, Lula was there, and he hit Lula, and they had to take Lula to the hospital. And then Lou got out; he was okay. But then he went and exercise and would jog. He's going to get this Roger back. <laughs> And doing that was a big deal. <laughs> Lou's brother was in the pen and got out of the pen. And he was harder than Lou. And they both got Roger. And they beat him up pretty bad. Put him in the hospital. And they even came into the operating room trying to finish him off. But oh, wow. That's a lot worse. But anyways, one of the funny things with Lou Lullaby, after this, Roger got okay and was going, you know, doing this. Lula, we're upstairs in the hall, and little everybody's in the in, in the in the toilet, sitting in the toilet. And uh, one guy who can good at imitating, and he had a blank gun, started pistol, blank, and he goes in and he's and he pretended he was Roger. I'm getting you now, Lou. Oh. And he went over there and put this gun over top, and bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and Lou was going, oh, 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 and he's. <laughs> <laughs> You got about twenty guys all around the camp. <laughs> <laughs> so that was. <laughs> so, but this Lou, he 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 got in fights all the time, and finally he got he got in a fight with uh, this guy Carl. Carl was a big soccer player. He come down and Lou was on the ship, and Carl just grabbed him and held him over the side of the ship and the riverside and said, "You're you smart enough." Boy, I'll drop you again. I'll let you go. And so that was the end of it. Lou never had any, <laughs> you know, no problem with Lou. But then Lou got in a fight, tried to beat up a foreman. But that's oh, when there well. wasn't. He went off the beach. And he got, he got kicked off the beach. Mm -hmm. So then he went to be a bouncer in the Dunsmuir Cafe, Dunsmuir, Dunsmuir Bar. And yeah, he. He got off. I don't know how he did this. He stabbed the guy 13 times oh. and killed him and got off his self-defense. Wow. Mm. He was a bouncer. Now, he said the guy came after him with a knife. I don't know what the what, what this story was. <laughs> but he stabbed the guy 13 oh. times <laughs> and he got off his self-defense weapon. <laughs> did the union ever discipline him for fight all the fights that he got into or anything like that? That was... Uh, no, no, no. Until he got till he got till he got with a, with a foreman, then it was off the beach. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> it's 
good job to you know what I mean. But he, the lullaby, he just he he you couldn't sit and drink with him because if you sat and drank with him, he'd drink so much and then he'd get that glint in his eye, you know, hey, better leave, you know. Yeah, he'll he'll be looking for a fight. He, yeah, he'd he his best friend. He'd slug you just to, you know. <laughs> and Roger and him were best friends all this time before this happened. Mm -hmm. So the, the guys you were working with, uh, um, what kind of backgrounds were they from? Were they were they were, were, you know were they were they guys from were they French people? Were they? Uh... There was there was all kinds. I see, long showing <clears throat> the way it's set up. You're orangutan people who had. Uh, no responsibilities, that's how you started. Because if you only worked one day a week, either you were young like me, hanging around, or you, you couldn't be a family man or a steady, you couldn't support yourself. Mm -hmm. So it led to guys that were running time, single guys, you know, and uh, that's what led, that, that's how we, we came to be. Mm -hmm. And then as you came, you got more work and you worked, but then, these guys went and they got married and got families, but that's where, where it came from. It came from <coughs> single guys, you know, and uh, not not well educated guys or anything else. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. That was just the type of uh, questions you got to because it took you two years. They were really tough years mm -hmm. to get to get by. And if you only had that to work to support yourself in, you know, and unemployment insurance back and forth, it was tough. Other guys said, "I'll go work in the mail, or I'll go logging. It's steady. I'm not going to stay here." Mm -hmm. So that's why you had mostly single guys and guys that would get kicked out of school. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anybody that had grade twelve. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They would head down to the yeah. Docks they, would, for work. They, they were all the guys I knew didn't get past grade ten. Mm -hmm. You know. when, when you were growing up, so before before you before you got kicked out of school, did you know about the waterfront? Did you visit the docks ever? Mm. Yeah, I, I went up on the on the ships and looked at the engines. We went down and seen the the engines and checked the ships out just for something to do. I would go up there and I ask, you know, as we were working, can I go look around? And one of the crew would show me the engine and show me this, and I was quite interested. I had a, at 16, I could have went, I had a cousin from Norway who had his own shipping line. Mm -hmm. And he had his own, I don't know how many, but he had, he came in to, to uh, New Westminster with one of his ships, where the shipping was on. And he asked my dad, he said, I can take Dean on a ship and we can go and he can be a cabin boy or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And he asked me why. I go, well, at 16, I thought I was in love with this girl, and I didn't want to leave her, so I said no. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that's why, or else I would have probably would have had a completely different history, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. that this, uh, this cousin from Norway, this was yeah. uh, on your dad's side? Yeah, Uncle, uh, Cousin Odd, yeah. In fact, I was at, in 98, uh, I was there back in Norway to visit him and stuff and all my relatives back there. Drove all over Norway. He had a nice Mercedes Benz and I wow. drove it. I think I put almost 3,000 miles all over, up and down Norway and stuff. And it was a hard thing was, I'm driving, you know, on a <clears throat> nice big Mercedes Benz and I'm doing 100 clicks, you know, 100 whatever. And after I have driven it for, for, at noon, you know, he says, Dean, you want to drive my car? Do not go over 80 kilometers an hour. <laughs> so it was hard for me to drive and not go over 80 because him and his wife were there and I'm, you know, and they show me all around. 42 tunnels in Norway that I went through. Oh. But we didn't go to Oslo. He didn't like freeways, so no. <laughs> we went to all every place else, but not Oslo. <laughs> Your dad was born over there? Yes. Moved here in 1927. And uh, didn't know a word of English and got off his, the train at Stuart Valley in Saskatchewan and thought his uncle was going to come and pick him up, but he was two days early. I know. <laughs> so he found, he, found, he found out that he couldn't speak the language or anything. And, uh, he has quite a history. My dad has quite, you know, he was, the things that he had, if you want to talk about him, but he... <clears throat> 
In 27, he went there and he worked on a ranch. My uncle had a huge big ranch in the Stewart Valley. Where the Diefenbaker Lake is, mm -hmm. where that lake is, was all his ranch below that. Oh, wow. And used to be just a river going through. And he had to land on both sides. And uh, my dad was here a year. So 28, he said, look, I'm going to, I don't, everybody spoke Norwegian. He didn't. So he says, I'm going into Stuart, Stuart Valley, and, oh, no, Swift Current, and uh, I'm going to live there. So my uncle was a little bit mad at him, you know. But he went there and he became a carpenter. He was a good carpenter. Even when he was 10, I got one of his shelves. He made fantastic when he was 10. But, and he was a carpenter and uh, he learned English, learned English, learned the language. So, but he was, my dad was a saver. So 28 and 29 and 30. And then the depression really hit. And my uncle needed money for taxes, needed $350 for taxes or else he was going to lose his ranch. And he was coming around to see if anybody could borrow money from the pay, you know. And he came to my dad, and my dad had just had that much saved up over the two years. My dad gave it to him, mm -hmm. and that saved the ranch. And my uncle, it took my uncle, and it must have been tough, it took, my dad got married in 39, and my uncle paid him back on his wedding day, all the money plus interest. But it took that many years to save up through the Depression to get that. Hmm. You know, and <clears throat> my dad came out here in '44 and worked for Gilly Brothers fishing in a, in a fishing boat. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And with my uncle, Uncle Bert, we called him. But and uh, then he was up fishing, and he was coming back. And it's a beautiful day from Prince Rupert. No, no other ships around. And he was up in front of his fishing, his gill netter, and he fell off. <laughs> And he just said that he remembers that he's in the air. He was saying, Jesus, help me. And the next thing he remembers, he was, he was in the back of his boat, woke up in the back of his boat, and he was dry. Wow. And he came down here, and that was the last time. He never went <laughs> out fishing anymore. He says, thank you very much. That was my omen. That was my sign. I'm, so he came here, and he became a carpenter here. Mm -hmm. On dry land. It. Yeah, but then he brought us. I came out here in '45. Mm -hmm. Was born in Winnipeg and had my first birthday out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lived on uh, Agnes Street. Uh, and then uh, bought my mom bought the house in Carnarvon. Moved in there, and that was. Yeah. Did you work with other Norwegians, Swedes, Scandinavians? Longshore? Yeah. Oh yeah, like big land. He was a Swede, big, huge. Know, other ones. We were Ted Phillips, Johnny Horton. Johnny Horton was a, he was short, but broad. And you can imagine, we would wing up three by nines and two by twelves and stuff like that. And we'd have them as high as we could do it. Well, Johnny mm -hmm. Horton couldn't do it, so we'd put our end up mm -hmm. and he'd throw his end up. Mm. Can you imagine doing that eight hours a day? And it's just, you know, oh. three by nines, four by, tw and, you know, They'd be 20 feet long, and you guys, and he should have he thrown his hand up. You know, he was, he was a strong boy, you know. He was, and, Check it out. <laughs> yeah. And Len, this big Len, oh, he was <clears throat> he was so strong. I could tell you some stories about him, but we would, um, on Fletcher's, and, you know, and you have to wing those up, and there'd be four guys. He'd hold his end. Four of us would put our end up in the pile, and he would pick up his end and do it himself. <laughs> and he'd do that all day by himself, his end. Wow. And uh, he, uh, one time he and Johnny Horton, there was a package, uh, I think a 20-foot package of lumber, and it was and it was sticking out about six inches. And Johnny Horton, we had PVs. You know what PVs are? The sticks with metal spike with a metal end, you know, you stick in and they do it with loggers, do it with rolling logs. Mm -hmm. we, we used to do the PV work and we tried and we tried to get this package in and we couldn't, two of us. <clears throat> Len had gone for coffee. He, he would gone, took, he took the coffee lesson, he's coming back with coffee. So he came back and we're all sitting around coffee and Len's just getting up, well, what to do? And he sees that package 
out and he grabs a PV4 in like nothing, just, you know, <laughs> just for something to do. Uh, I, one time, I me and this Mark, we were playing hockey, but we were in Timbers 12 by 12s, we rollers, and we were fooling around with a working in Atlantic. My partner, he's doing all the work, and he's, Dean, now come on, I need to help. Ah, oh, yeah, I'll be the head there. And he's getting a little bit turbid, and so, but I'm getting perturbed, but he's bothering me. I want to play hockey. We're playing with stickers, and we're having a, you know, uh, go on to you. And I said, look at old man, shut up. <laughs> it took about three steps, and he's got me upside down by the ankle. <laughs> and you know where the ribs of a ship is? Well, we had, we could, there would be a hole there. Sure. Maybe about three foot square. And it go down, you know, 20 feet. He had me over that hole. He says, are you going to work or I'll drop you down the hole? And he had me by one a yes line. <laughs> there was no, there was no problem that I worked and stuff. You know, he was, <coughs> he was so big and I don't know what, you know, what a animal man, animal man. Why I would even think of uh, <laughs> talking back Sassy, to him. Yeah. Sassy, yeah. Sassy, yeah. was just, you know, he was really, so very fortunate he was a really nice guy mm. you know you, you had you really had to do something to get him so I mean, is this the one that got into yeah. all the fights well he was a guy that got blackie down you know what i mean so blackie steigenberg must have really said something to get lenda oh, okay. push him but he never gotten any and uh, you know len, was, len, len wasn't the guy who became a bouncer no that was lou that was lou, lou. Yeah. lou. okay but Len was. You were in the same. You were in the same gang with Len. Yeah, for a year. Oh, for a year. Yeah, I learned how to drive winch. Al Parson taught me how to drive winch, steam winch. That's not, my first time I drove steam winch. With Al was another story. <laughs> we're on glass. You can imagine nice big, you know, packages of glass coming up, and we take him, and he comes over there and he says, "This is a Johnson bar down." And up, and this is your steam. And you give me steam. Okay, and he's on the other winch. And I'm on the yard. So it gives us the signal to go up. Well, I open up the steam full blast down. Well, zing, it goes. Oh. And it goes up right. And stop it. And stops. And, and he brings it over this way. And come down. Zing, down. And I mean, that glass, which it was real. You know, it just, the rail of the ship, it must have missed it, missed it just by that much. Oh, wow. And we dropped it and we put it down on the, on Al passed and put it down on the dock and it was nice. So Al came over to me and he said, don't open it up wide. You open it up slowly, just as much steam as you need, not full bar, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I, so after that, okay, you know. I, Is that how you learn things? That's like if how something happened, things. a mistake happened, that's yeah, how you picked that's, it up as you went? How, yeah, and that was how I learned. And he was the best winch driver and crane driver on the beach at that time. This is Vancouver, New West. He was he was the best. Was so when you say you you've used the word the beach, you've talked about the beach. Is 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 the beach a specific place, or is the beach any old waterfront? The beach, what I call, is where a longshoreman worked on the waterfront. That's called the beach. We all call, we call the beach that would be in Vancouver. And the, uh, the waterfront where Longshore works, where the docks are, New Westminster, even Prince Hubert, that'd be the beach. <laughs> and we were, or if, anywhere where ILWU Longshoreman worked, normally we'd call it the beach. Hmm. You know? And uh, that's, that's Is my that interpretation. Why, okay. Is that why Longshoremen wear Hawaiian shirts, or is that because of Harry Bridges? <laughs> um, I tell you the truth, I really don't know. I, I don't know why, you know, it could be for Harry Bridges, but not for why. 99% of it would be for Harry Bridges, but I haven't, you know, I, I couldn't say for sure, mm -hmm. but it'd be for Harry Bridges. Mm -hmm. You know, you do something for him. He was the start of our hope. See, we would have, our, our, our ILWU for years would have nothing to do with the ILA at the other end. They were gangster run, and we would completely have nothing to do with them. And it's just lately, the last few years, that we've started to do things with them, and that bothers me. We should I, stay right away from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have, you know, and that's what's made our union so strong and stuff. 
because we have completely stayed away from any unions, you know, gangster, or even uh, the Teamsters Union. We have stayed away. We have our own, you know, and we've we've done very well that way. Mm -hmm. By uh, completely watching who, who's running our unions and stuff like this, and we have all kinds of guys work on our docks. And there could be something else on the outside, but when it comes to the docks, you're longshoreman. You're, you're 502 or you're a 500, and that is the most important. You could have Hells Angels, you could have anybody else, but when it comes to there, you're, you're family there. Mm -hmm. And what you do on the outside doesn't interfere with what you do here. And you make sure that 502, at least, you know, you don't ruin the reputation of 502, no matter what you do. Does 502 have a good reputation for good work and that kind yes, of thing? Yes, yeah. We have, in my opinion, the best reputation of all the locals hmm. in the ILWU. Uh, let's take car ships. We, we finish a car ship in four hours. The next best to us, I think, is two days. Same ship, wow. same amount. You know? That's incredible. Or, not, uh, yeah, two days. Some of them have gotten up to two shifts. Two eight-hour shifts. Well, I call that two days, but two shifts, and they'll do what we do in four hours. When it comes to doing other, uh, you know, any production, anything else, we are head and shoulders way above any other mm -hmm. local that does it. Is it quickness of turnaround that would be that would lead to a good reputation? Yes, the ships turn around because mm -hmm. then when they're in docks, they're losing money. Mm -hmm. So, and. <clears throat> We, we had, didn't have, in the 60s, uh, we were really safety oriented. And so the, some of the companies didn't like it, so they didn't have to send ships over here mm. because we made sure. But we, hey, we stuck to our guns and we produced. And so it finally came around that we had the safety plus we produced. Wow. And, uh, and good work good. and good work. Well and, done. Yep, yeah. yeah, well done. Good work. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had some tough jobs, you know, like, I mean, the jobs we had with, <clears throat> with lead and stuff. We yeah. could, you know, heavy. You, heavy, but you couldn't do it faster than we could. There's mm -hmm. no other person. That, <laughs> we, I mean, a load would come down, it'd be 45 bars to a load, and there'd be, you, there'd be two men to a load. And they'd drop the 45 bars, found the load, onto a dolly, and you'd push it into the wing. And they would go back and get another load. And come back and drop another 45 bar load on the other side and they would do the same thing and then go back and get your load well we could wheel our load in unload it before the gear could come back with the other load on the other side <laughs> that's just two guys so we they couldn't bring it fast enough to us wow. and that's with the with the gear they couldn't do it so, I mean, that just shows you the production we had. And with, with, with zinc, it was 60-pound bars. That was even faster. And you get uh, lumber, you know, everything was... Uh, our production was really good. No, it was really good. And another thing the ships liked was the, uh, the barnacles. They could get all kinds of barnacles going, you know, and they come up the fresh water, we'd kill the barnacles. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, so they could get a little bit, maybe an extra knot or something mm -hmm. out, of, out of it. And that's one of the things they liked. Did you feel like you guys were tight together in those years too? Was it yeah, like I, a family yeah, you felt? Yeah, or? yeah, it was tight. It was like a family and stuff. And like in a family, you get some guys that bug you and you get your brother or you know, <laughs> whatever. But I mean, no matter what, you were a family. When, mm -hmm. it, come, when it really came down to it, you were 502. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... So. Did you feel like you had a sense of identity about 502? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 502 was really a big sense of identity, who you were in the community, you know, who you were amongst your friends and everything else. It was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was just something else. And I mean, uh, you talk to tugboat guys too, you know, they had a big sense of identity. Hey, I worked the tugs. Yeah. And the people that I met that worked the waterfront, and from tugboats to whatever they did, they had a good sense of identity and a good sense of pride in what they did, mm -hmm. where they worked. 
and I, I'm doing this. So, I mean, uh, the same for you that sense yeah. of pride in being same. a longshoreman and a yeah. 502 longshoreman, yeah. 502 then specifically. Longshoreman. We would say, yeah, 500 Vancouver, those guys, I, I, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> and they'd probably say the same about us, you know. But, yeah. Did you have rivalry with those guys in 500? Friendly rivalry or a. Well, a little bit, but they we moved between. If there's, oh, if there's right, no work yeah. in Van, in New West, we go to Vancouver and go to get dispatched out of their hall at the warfare. And if there was no work there, they would come mm-hmm. here and get dispatched. So there was really friendly little drives, <laughs> but not really, you know, not much. <clears throat> but one thing they were good at is is stowing the booze. Mm. They're going to boost ship over there, get stuck, you know, put it different ways. So the ships come in with some city and say, okay, up here and here and here is where the bottles are. <laughs> <laughs> so we would know where to go, you see. Uh-huh. <laughs> so there were ships that called in Vancouver and then they came around and called yeah, here? Yeah, called here, yeah. So what was that? Was that they load them in New West? Well, they would offload some cargoes in Vancouver and then they'd offload some cargoes in New West. Okay. You know. And they would let us know, hey, what's, you know, where the things are. If there's anything like. good? Anything good. Where they stashed it, because they had their field, so they'll stash it. Yeah, 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 sure. Because they would know where it's going next. Yeah. So would, would uh, like, booze, bottles of booze and stuff ever disappear from a ship or be lifted or oh, anything well, yeah. like that? Well, yeah, I could tell you a story. <laughs> there was some booze and on a booze ship here, PCT Dock. You know, we had a fence around PCT talk at that mm-hmm. time. <clears throat> and the guys were there, and the guys go to the Dunsman and sitting there, and it's only day shift you work, so it's in the Friday night. Well, let's go back and get some booze and milk, because they'd got some already, and they sold it. Mm-hmm. Needed more. Well, they'd climb over the fence, go on, and get us on the winch, and go down below, and load up a pellet, and get a lift truck, and <laughs> everything else, and go back to the, to the fence, and put it over top, and get some more. And they'd go back to the dunny, and... You know, and uh, sit there and drink some more, and you know, a few hours. Let's go get some more. Uh, pretty well, go on the fence again. Go down, get on the ship, chuck the winches up, and everything. Go down the hatch. Start. Well, the crew, <laughs> well, they, what's going on here? <laughs> so they phoned up the company. They said, "Have you got an afternoon shift day working on here?" Company says, "No, we haven't got anybody working here tonight." <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a gang here working. <laughs> so, they got over the fence, but then the, the cops come and caught them all. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, one guy uh, that was there in, in it, uh, when they were going through the court cases and stuff, whatever, uh, he, he was my winch driver, and I, one day we were going to to work and he says I, he cover for me I'll you know I'll be there 15 minutes so you know 15 20 minutes I says okay so I was up there and I drove the crane for him and stuff and did my thing and he didn't show up and I looked down and he was at New Westminster rooms as an ambulance is there and stuff and what's going on there and anyways he didn't show up all night so I, I had to call a replacement that we had to, you know so they got a replacement for him and that was the night I went to the you know I, I go to the nightclub and here was his girlfriend. He said, "Yeah, yeah, daily overdose. He died. He died of an overdose. So uh, all the blame went to him oh. <laughs> for all that. Mm-hmm. So the guys that were involved got <laughs> off with nothing or next to nothing. Wow. What did he overdose on? Heroin. Oh wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was that he was only twenty six too? Oh no, you know, that's right? too bad." Mm-hmm. Were there guys that did drugs or yeah, anything like that that worked on the waterfront? Yeah, very, very few. One, two. It, it was just starting to come in drugs at that time, you know. Mm-hmm. And there was one, my best friend was a two, three, you know, maybe four or five guys, you know. They did it. But they were doing drugs was, you know, guys sort of pitied them, you know, you poor guy, you know, you know yeah. doing that. And, uh, you know, but the guys that are my friends that did drugs, uh, they did drugs for 25 years. They didn't get off them until 25 years later. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I don't know why I never did. 
he was if I kind of have to say when I look back on it, it's if God put a hedge around me. Because I was with them, they were my best friends. Let's go to Vancouver, let's do some dope. Let's, and I never said, no, I'm good for it, whatever. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when I'm going to go with Roger or Brian or that, you're a girl, well, come here, let's go here, or something with them. And I wouldn't go, and I'd say, no, i got to go here. So I never ever did drugs. I did a little bit of grass. Mm -hmm. here, yeah. But I never ever did the hard stuff. Not because I had any willpower and I said no, mm -hmm. just that. Every time it come to happen, something would come along and yeah. take me away it from it. Just happened that way. Just happened that way. And uh, a lot of my friends didn't make it through the 60s because of that, you mm -hmm. know. Sure. And would a lot of the guys that maybe had drinking problems that drank too much or did drugs or anything like that, was their work affected when they came into work? Or were they still able to show up and do the job? And Most of them were. Uh, the ones that, were, that affected their work and didn't, well... They were, you know, you, you covered for them. And if they didn't show up for work, they were a couple of hours late, you work them, and they always, and if you were drunk and hung over the next day or whatever <laughs> else, they covered for you. Everybody mm -hmm. sort of covered for everybody else, and it all worked out okay, just the same as, you know, Dale, you know. <clears throat> covered for me for half an hour or something, I'll be back, and I covered for him till six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so after six, but after a while, you couldn't cover for him anymore. I had to get. And, uh, you know, everybody covered for everybody else because you were, you were like family. And, yeah. You know, sure, and, sure. A guy, and, and if a guy's drinking too much and he's drunk, we just go sit in the corner there. Go over and just go to sleep and sit in the corner. And, mm -hmm. You know, he'd, he'd, be, he'd sleep for a couple of three hours and, okay, get up and go to work. <laughs> ready to know, go? Ready to go. So would you be protecting each other from the company? Or yeah. if you were covering for someone, was that yeah. from the company or yeah, from yeah. the foreman? Or? yeah. But even if, even the foreman, I mean, in those days, if you didn't have the bottle, the foreman bought the bottle. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was drinking in those days was just, uh, you know, in my experience, was just the way what you did. Yeah. And was it was it different at West Shore? Yeah, it was completely different. And it was and 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 was was it different there because it was West Shore? Or was it different because you were older and uh, and and you were a Christian and? Uh, well, it was more? different. It was different there because the guys there were older. It was a steady job. You were away from. Uh, you you were way out in the ocean. You were away from the bars. There's no way you could get to a bar. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and, and lunchtime you spent it there so you got paid for your lunchtime mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. long show and you got an hour off you weren't paid for it at West Shore you were paid from 8 to 4 mm -hmm. you worked from 8 to 4 from 4 to midnight or from midnight to 8 mm -hmm. and you got paid for your lunch hour and your coffee so you couldn't leave the site you know you were sure. paid and uh, and the people there that were out there they were older they were family men and at that time you know you went Settle down a little bit. You were bit. settled down and everybody yeah, settled down yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And uh, it ended up being you know, a, a great job. You know. mm -hmm. uh, company was, in this West Shore Terminals, it was really a good company. Like a friend of mine, he was 50, 58, and he started to lose his memory. And we could tell him on the job, you could tell him to go do something. He'd go and he, then he'd figure, what did you see me to do, you know? And one time he came in there when he was 59, not quite 59, and uh, he was looking for, we have names for overtime. You mark your hours down, sure. your dispatch, and he's looking at the board, and our vice president was there, and he says, Jerry, uh, what are you looking for? He says, I can't find my name. And his name was right there. Oh. So he just took Jerry and he went, our vice president, went up to the <coughs> company, explained to him, and that afternoon, Jerry was retired with full benefits as if he worked to 65. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, that's how fast it was. He was off, retired, and, you know. Right now, I saw him at the, you know, talked to his wife was there, but he, he can't even count money right now, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But he had a, while he was, uh, before the, the brain came, he had a fantastic life. He had a very good life. He was mm -hmm. very good with money. I mean, his house was like the type of house you see in a magazine. It was mm -hmm. fantastic. He must have had two hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, furniture in his house. You know, wow. you know, he had a good life, but then his memory just went. You know, Alzheimer's. He's, he's on, I don't know, stage seven or something of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 
The company treated him well, though, you felt? Yes, the company, I have to say, West Shore, treated it, treats its employees very well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was very fortunate to work for them, I, I think so. Mm-hmm. And I don't know anybody that works for West Shore that doesn't think the same way I do. Oh, we all have squabbles or, you know, trees or things or whatever they're doing, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, uh, no, we get down to it. They're, they're a very good company to work for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, though they uh, defeat the management, now I'm talking about foremen, but non-union management, mm-hmm. superintendents, in my opinion, and the bosses, you know, the head guys, not very well at all. Cause, I mean, I when I went through, I went through a lot of bosses and how they got fired. Mm-hmm. They go, they come to work one day, and there's your the card sitting there. Yep, here's your stuff. Get out of your car. Here's a cab for you. Gone. Wow. Or they would finish me at work, and the, the secretary you would know that they're fired. The secretary would leave early at three o'clock, and they would come in there and say, here's everything. Take your stuff, and you out. Don't get near any computers. Don't get nothing. You're, you're, and you're and they're gone, and they don't even know about it. They, 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 so, but they treated the union employees very well. But, why do you uh, think that was? Why they treated us so well? Yeah. They needed us. They needed our cooperation. We did a. <clears throat> our production was the best in the world mm-hmm. for the size and for the equipment, everything. So, I mean if. If you're a good employee, and I've been on negotiating committees and stuff, and I've been the plant chairman at West Shore and stuff, if you're a good employee, that you, that you that's your best negotiating position. If you're a good employee, mm-hmm. if you the company needs you, so they'll give you what you want if they can, you know. But if you're a, a bad employee, you got a bunch of employees that don't care. Well, why would the you know, company? You got no position to stand on if mm-hmm. you negotiate the contract. Mm-hmm. So. That's why. That's the only thing I can think to say. Very, mm-hmm. very good employees. We, you know, uh, you have the odd, probably five percent or less that screw up, but they don't last. You know, because you know, mm-hmm. even the union says, "Look at, you know, smarten up and you know, you know." And I've, I've been the shop stewards, and I've had to, you know, <laughs> deal with them and deal with some guys <laughs> that are just no good. You know, you don't even want them there. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah, and you just, and how do you, you can't defend them or anything else, you know? Yeah. Sure. I, though as a shop steward, I had quite the experience, and I never did ask. I never know why. One of the employees, a friend of mine, and I'm shop steward, and I'm on a machine. He says, Dean, I'm talking to Great Scott, and he was the head president of the whole thing. He comes in, you know, come on with me, and go on in. And I can tell that Brian is 10 feet in the air, just a hump, and he's so mad. So, anyways, I say, okay, and I got a replacement for him, for me, and I got a replacement, you know, for both of us. I said, we've got to go in and we got to do some, mm-hmm. you know, talk. And I'm trying to find out what this is all about before we go in there. Because mm-hmm. I'm, and I know Brian is just, ah. So, we go in there, and Scott is sitting at his desk, and I, being fed, and I, Brian just goes open that door. What? And I go in there and I'm, Scott looks up. Brian, you got no time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to go after your family. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do everything out these rent. And even I'm just, what am I going to do? You know, what's going on there? And Scott is sitting there. And you know something? Brian just after he did this, he turned around and walked out. And I don't know what to say. And I look at Scott and he looks at me. And he doesn't say nothing. So I walk out. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Scott never mentioned that to me. Brian never mentioned that to me in all the rest of the years. It was, a, you know, never, no nothing. You never found out what it was? Never found out what it was. What I heard from Joe Briggs when I told Joe Briggs years later, he says, yeah, the rest of Scott got security for his house and stuff like that. Mm. But Brian never got, I thought Brian's fired and he's, you know, done it. No. It was absolutely nothing. No Strange. mention of it, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know what the heck. It, it, in my opinion, anyway, it wasn't union thing. It was something personal Person? that they both knew about. Yeah, sure. That, uh, <laughs> you know, 
there's, it, it, I expected some repercussions, you know, <laughs> but there was nothing. It was mm. just, it never happened. Suspicious. <laughs> so. Okay, it's noon. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, it was noon. <laughs> it's the girl. Okay, I just thought you were going to tell you. <laughs> well, I don't know if you mind us holding on to that, maybe, if we can use your... Yeah, well, this is... your notes. Dealing with our stocks. Uh, uh, just working the docks, fights in the docks. Okay, characters on the dock. I've got a couple of characters that I was, you know, we're talking we, about. We should. I think we should have a, have a. We should set up a time to just, you know, and we'll be more. Uh, we'll keep. We'll keep the boundaries around it. <laughs> yeah, you got. Yeah, you got. But, but got I think. I think. I think it would would probably be a to good come idea back for, for a, a second. Yeah, interview. come back for another one and, yeah. and just you know a little. But we'll just, we'll just... So hold on to those. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll let you... You can use this to me. Right. I'll uh, hey, keep this, and if you ask me some questions out of that, and especially... I'll bring it back back. next time. Yeah. yeah. The back. 